This is the Microsoft Cloud Show episode 208, where AC and I are going to talk about all the latest cloud news for Office 365 and Azure, recorded live August 15th, 2017. What if you could take any process your teams use to get work done and make it happen automatically? What if you could save countless hours and help people work better together? Nintex can make it happen. With a Nintex platform, work flows from person to person, system to system, to the cloud and back. And it flows in and out of the tools you use every day. With Nintex, work just flows, so your teams can work smarter, work faster, and be more connected than ever. AC. CJ. I'm glad you made it back, buddy. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> the enthusiasm is yeah. enthralling. <laughs> there's, the mono- there's the monotony of our jobs right now, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. How's life anyway, my friend? Hey, it's going good. Spent last week in your neck of the woods in downtown Seattle doing the... Yes, it, um, it was nice to see you in the smokiness that was Seattle as well. It was. Got the haze. I thought that when I show up in Seattle, you guys had a different kind of smoke that was legalized, but no, some forest fires <laughs> up, in, up in Canada, but... Uh, Everybody was just so baked that the entire atmosphere was full of smoke. I don't know. Walking through yeah. the city streets, it kind of felt like there was a, a significant part of the population was definitely in that category. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe they were. Yeah. Well, it's all cleared away now. Yeah. BC Canada was, or maybe it still is, I'm not sure, was on fire and it was all, all the smoke was uh heading south over the border and uh, smoked us out. So hmm. it was pretty rough. Everybody was wheezing and carrying on. It was terrible. Yeah, that's. it was a bit of a surprise to show up and kind of like, you know, you, it's one of the nice things you get. Nice, cool weather in Seattle, especially coming from Florida. And instead, I got about the same temperatures that I'm used to down here in Florida. So whatever. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, what have you been up to? Oh, man. Other uh, than visiting. Anything else going on? No, not a whole hell of a lot. Uh, I guess we can do, I was going to give you a little bit of update on uh, on work stuff here. Yeah, sure. Where are you at? Well, I got, well, there's two bits. So we got one podcast kind of update that we can, that you and I can share. One of them is we are definitely confirmed for doing a live show at Ignite. And it looks like it's going to be streamed on YouTube and our Facebook live oh, yes. channels. But we, if you can't tune in, we will also take the recording and convert it to an MP3 and put it out as a normal show the week of Ignite, which is what the, I think the week of September the 25th. Fifth? Yeah. I think that's a Monday. I think we are live on Tuesday, the 26th. We, we will send an, an email out to everybody on our newsletter. And uh, we got a couple, we got a bunch of plans that we have that week for Ignite. I would like to ask anybody if you have a question that we'd like to read out on the air. We are just kind of putting some ideas together about what we want to do in our live show, aside from talking about the big news from Ignite and just some banter and some stuff. So if you got any questions or any kind of topics you think would be cool for us to discuss, let us know. We'd love to do that. So just send us an email by jumping on our mailing list and send us a mail or by going to our site and just leaving us a comment. If you're obviously going to Ignite, obviously we'd love to see you at the show. We'll let you know the details. We'll send out a email to everybody on the on our email list with details of when the show's going to be, where it's going to be, how to get there, what time it's going to be, and things like that. And also, it looks like we may have some T-shirts to give away. T-shirts and stickers. While we're there as well. Yeah. So uh, definitely come in and... Um, we may have some swag to hook you up with as well. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I guess in terms of the just update, the other thing that I got going on is I still, you know, the Voitano side working on my SharePoint framework or my mastering SharePoint framework developer course. Yeah, how's it coming along? Uh, it's coming along great. It's, um, you know, obviously like anything, you'd like to be farther along than you are. But yep. I got a bunch of chapters recorded. I plan on doing a pre-release this month in August. So I think that by the time this recording comes out, it'll probably be another week or so. But I'm right now I'm targeting the August the 31st, the last day for a pre-release. I'm not entirely sure if I'm going to have like only a limited number of people can buy it at that time, but it will be at a discount because it's only going to be a part, a subset of the fundamentals course that's going to be there. So really just core stuff like building client-side web parts, working with the property pane, all the details about property pane, deployment, external files, stuff like that. But the good thing is, is that with the work that I'm doing now, I've got a pretty good cadence going of where I'm doing all of like the creative work. So building the demos, building the script, writing it all, the script meaning like a a Google doc that I read from when I record stuff, 
But the good thing is also, and then I do all the production to put the course together. But what I found is as I've been producing the last few chapters, I've been taking notes on the side, like, you know, what can I get somebody else to help me with? Mm. And um, there's two different categories there. If anybody wants to, you know, the behind the scenes of this, people actually asked me, you know, we should do an episode on building a, an online training course, which I don't really know if I want to do that or not. <laughs> Cause it's kind of messy, but, um, <laughs> it's like, uh, it's the sausage making yeah. behind the scenes. Yeah. So what I've done though is I found, uh, I found somebody, uh, who is they take the raw audio files that I create and they run them through all like the post audio recording stuff. So things like, Noise reduction, doing a, a hard gate, a limiter, making sure that the audio doesn't go spike way out or way down below and stuff like that. So something that like our guy that does, um, Rade that does our podcast, I'm somebody local who's working with me to get that stuff done. But then the other thing they're doing too is they're going through, this is actually, I've, this has been a huge productivity boost. When I write stuff in the doc, I use the like HTML terms. I use an H1 to signify a new lesson within a chapter. So a lesson is just like a clip, like a, like a video file. And then inside of that, whether it's a demo or it's slides or whatever, I then use H1s through H5s to do different like sections. And one of the things he does is he goes through the audio, not only cleans up the audio, but he also finds anywhere that I've screwed up and I've had to restate something. And he silences that part out, doesn't cut it out, but silences it out on the wave file. And then he also goes in and creates a sub clip, which is the entire lesson. So that's like a marker in the metadata inside the video or the audio file that says, you know, this time frame is for this lesson. And then inside of it, he does a separate marker for each one of the H2s through H5s with the name of the marker. So that now when I'm assembling it, it's basically just like taking components and dropping them in and then just kind of moving things around. Hooking it all up. Yeah, yeah, that's one. And the other thing that's been super helpful is when you're doing that and you want to add embellishments, like, you know, adding a little call out to lines 11 through 14 or adding an overlay or a fly-in for a link or, you know, see this other reference. Those things are tedious. And so mm. what I do is that when I'm building it, I drop a marker in the file. I tag it as a green marker, which is the default kind of marker. And then I describe what I want done. And when I'm done producing the course, I take it, export the project, put it in a folder on Google Drive, and I have another guy that goes in and he basically takes all those green markers as to-do items and he runs through all of them and finishes it up. So Adds them all in. Nice. It lets me be the creative person, let somebody else be the creative and the original content person, and it lets two other people work while I'm working to kind of do the stuff that is, I don't want to call it busy work, but it's stuff that somebody else can do that they don't have any they don't have any value to add. I don't have any value to add in it. I've already told them what I want done. Yeah. It just needs it's repetitive tasks, right? Exactly. And so these two things gotcha. are, are gonna allow me that I think that people will probably be I'll, I'll be completely honest. I'm gonna be disappointed by how much content I release on the thirty first. I would like to I release more. And I think other people will as well. They'll be like, oh, I thought there was going to be more. And it might think like, you know, hey, it's too expensive for what you're offering. But keep in mind when I, when you buy it, you're gonna get all the future updates. The cool thing is now that I've kind of hit this cadence and this workflow piece is that I've got, I should be able to knock out big chunks of chapters every yeah. single month. So whether it's going to be a monthly drop or a bi-monthly or you know, two drops a month, I don't know. But I'm, I finally feel like I've got a good workflow that's going to allow me to kind of churn through stuff. Nice. Yeah. So Real nice. it's going. How about you? Yeah, it sounds like you're picking up the cadence. Yeah. Yeah, good. I'm, um, what am I doing at the moment? Uh, a couple of things. Trying to hire, actually. It's probably the my least favorite part of my job, mm. I've got to tell you. I find it so hard to find people and sift through resumes and line up interviews and do all that sort of stuff. I just find it really tedious. I just want somebody good. Mm. Like, I don't know why it's so hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I can understand that. So, yeah, I'm doing that at the moment. We're, um, we're hiring another engineer on my team. I think we're actually getting close now. I've said that it's been painful. It has been painful, but I think we're, we're down to uh, a short list. So um, I think we'll be picking somebody pretty soon, which would be good. And other than that, I call myself a dev, kind of, historically a dev at least. But at Hyperfish, you know, we're a small team. And so we don't have any purely operations people. The engineering team run our cloud service, and that means sharing the load amongst folks. And some of the time that lands on me to do things. And to be honest, I kind of enjoy it in some ways. So anyway, the other day I was looking at our production infrastructure 
And for some time, I'd planned some updates to it. You know, we created the, the infrastructure some time ago or provisioned the infrastructure some time ago and some things have changed. So things like managed disks in Azure for virtual machines, for example, I wanted to take advantage of those because it's a pain in the butt to manage VHDs for your VMs. And so finally, I scheduled some time and, um, and some effort on my part to go through and refresh some production infrastructure. So basically, I replaced half of our production infrastructure on the fly with no downtime. And I sound pretty pleased with myself, I know, because I kind of am. <laughs> but, but honestly, I think I don't think we could have done it without the effort that we'd put into automation and scripting and what we've done with Docker and Docker Cloud in terms of being able to, and microservice or mini service type architecture of our application. So I could move around parts of our app to other parts of our infrastructure and scale them out to other parts of our infrastructure and then remove them off the bits that I wanted to replace without any sort of downtime. Mm. And so I sort of shifted around the back end parts onto newly provisioned infrastructure and then removed the old parts and things just just went. And um, I mean, it's terrifying doing things like that, but but it all worked and it was it was really uh, it was really nice. Normally, you'd have to schedule time after hours and things to schedule some downtime and then go and replace things and do all that sort of stuff. But I was able to do it in the middle of the day with no downtime, and our customers carried on wow. and didn't didn't know what we were doing behind the scenes. But I sort of I blame Docker and Docker Cloud and automation that we could do with Azure to be able to pull it off. It was kind of fun. Did your customers notice any of that stuff was even going on? Do you guys ever have any kind of downtime? And then two, I think you might have just answered this, but what do you think is like, was the silver bullet or, you know, your Rubicon that allowed you to do this with such ease to be able to make, I mean, maybe, you know, clearly it's stressful, but to be able to move infrastructure around, is that Docker Cloud? Is it the microservice architecture? What do you think really was the thing that, that really enabled you to do all that? Stateless microservices. Mm, gotcha. So you don't you don't store any data in them. You just everything's message based. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, there was obviously data stored at some point because it goes in a database. But from a microservice point of view, each of those microservices aren't stateful. They don't hold their own state about a particular session that's going on or what have you. And that means that we can have multiple of them, and load balance. And as soon as you can load balance and have multiple of them, you can add new ones in other places and remove the old ones mm. and sort of balance the load across to the new infrastructure really easily. Mm. So yeah, we didn't have any downtime. There was one process that happens in our service that is, there aren't multiple of them. There's one, I don't know what you'd want to call it, cron job, if you will, scheduled process, right, that happens periodically. Mm -hmm. And that was offline for about 10 or 15 seconds. But that's not important because it was... It's a back-end. It's a back-end thing. It doesn't drive any UI. There's no customer experience there. It actually, it sends emails. So if an email is 10 or 15 seconds late, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. So yeah, we're able to spin up new services on the newly provisioned infrastructure and then take away the old ones off the old infrastructure and the sort of the load balancing all happens automatically and, uh, and people didn't notice. Cool. So you could have been using the app and hitting go and... I guess there is a very, very small chance that a particular transaction or UI, you know, request died halfway through, but we're pretty careful about the way we do load balancing to desaturate particular parts of our app and move the load across to new parts. So that's awesome. That shouldn't happen. Yeah. I have one question about that then. The other part that I already have one question. I have another question about that that I think that most developers are kind of be curious about, which is how much time did it take? To do that, first to get ready to do it, mm. to kind of plan it out, and then how, what's the actual execution that you talked about? And like, yeah, yeah, I think one thing before I move on to that, I don't think it's technology specific. So when I said stateless microservices, I think you could do it with any sort of technology that that you want to pick to to build your app. I don't think it's Node specific or Docker specific or Docker Cloud specific or Azure specific or C Sharp or .NET or whatever, right? It's building an app in a certain way that allows you to do that. Gotcha. You can get yourself into a hairy bucket of mess with all of those things if you're not careful. Yeah. It's not a technology solution. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I probably spent, I think, about an hour scripting some new infrastructure provisioning, you know, to spin up new nodes with managed disks and a few bits and pieces and testing that in, um, in some test environments, making sure they spun up correctly and joined the right things and all that. And then probably execution, I would say about 
20 to 30 minutes. Wow. Maybe 45 in total, you know, executing, building the new infrastructure, obviously executing the scripts to provision the new infrastructure. When the new infrastructure spun up, they automatically joined our cluster. Then I, you know, hit a couple of buttons and, and it redistributed components of our application onto those nodes. Then I shifted once I'd verified and tested that the new stuff was taking load and was working correctly, then deprovisioned the old ones off the old infrastructure. So the new one took up all of the backend load of our application and then deprovisioned the old infrastructure. After I waited a little while, actually. I sort of waited an hour or two before I completely deprovisioned the infrastructure just to make sure everything was going smoothly and I didn't need to switch it back on in a hurry. That's like magic, man. That's awesome that it goes that easy. Yeah, it was kind of enjoyable to see it go like that. <laughs> yeah, I bet it was. A sort of level of satisfaction of, of it working. Oh, yeah. hell yeah. Awesome. The Microsoft Cloud Show is sponsored by Valid.nl. Valid's motto is stay ahead. Its mission is to enable its customers to excel in their business through the innovative use of IT. Valid is always on the lookout for new colleagues. If you're interested in all things happening at Azure, whether in infrastructure, SQL Server, Office 365, Power BI, SharePoint, or .NET, look them up on valid.nl. Give CodeShip Pro a try. More teams than ever are using Docker and Linux for their .NET applications. CodeShip Pro is a fully customizable, continuous integration and delivery service in the cloud with the best support for any team that is using .NET and Docker together and can run builds on Linux environments. CodeShip Pro comes with ready-to-use integrations for Azure, including Azure Container Services and more. It also offers a free, convenient local CLI tool that allows you to run your builds locally and is the only hosted CI CD that lets you build your own environment, giving you the most control and flexibility no matter what tool or stack you're trying to use. Check out CodeShip Pro's free plan that grants 100 builds per month, unlimited projects and unlimited users. Open source projects are always free on CodeShip. Visit Codeship.com today or check out Codeship.com forward slash features forward slash pro to learn more. Hey, so um, we should probably move on to the nuts and bolts of the show, which is some news. So we've got a couple of miscellaneous things. We've got some Azure news. We've got some Office 365 news. And we've got our picks. You want me to get started with some news or you want to go first? What do you want to do? I can knock out two quick ones and then I let you take over for a little bit. How's that sound? Go for it. All right. So we talked about it in a previous episode, the Azure Container Instances. And one of the things that we did, we talked about how there was a whole you know nice what this was and why it was so epic and all that stuff. It was interesting. I had a few people at the conference last week come up and talk to me about it. But the newstack.io, which is a podcast and also a news site, they had a really good article that kind of talks about how important this was and the behind the scenes and all that kind of stuff. That was pretty cool. The other bit that I wanted to just highlight, too, was that Docker has an article on their site. They've got the site success.docker.com. And under their architecture section, they published an article just recently, which is a reference architecture for Docker logging design and best practices. I kind of poked around through it a little bit. I, I found it to be really interesting. Some of the stuff you already knew or some of the stuff I already knew. But I did pick up a few little nuts and bolts that I thought were uh, pretty useful. So we'll make sure I have uh, links to both of those in the show notes. Yeah, nice. Okay, I've got one on communication sites for Office 365. So there was a tweet. Dan Holm retweeted it, but it was from the at SharePoint handle on Twitter. Rollout complete. SharePoint communication sites hit 100% across Office 365 worldwide production. Fast, beautiful, mobile, and engaging. Kudos to the team, GA. So um, communication sites are the new sort of, I guess, publishing sites in a way for internal or rolling out a, a site internal at a company that lets you um, author a nice looking site for getting across news or team information or part of your intranet or something along those lines. So you can go create those. They're in everybody's tenants now and they're pretty, pretty easy to create. Also, along with that, Michael Svensson, I think I'm pronouncing his last name, mm -hmm. name correctly, put out a post called Enabled External Sharing on Communication Sites. So um, he goes through, he's got a blog post here that talks about how do you turn on external sharing and have it work with communication sites, which I thought was pretty cool. Mm. So for example, we've got a partner portal for our partners at Hyperfish that um, I think this would be a good candidate for. So we, um, you know, we just use a regular team site right now and 
use external sharing to turn it on to get people in there. And uh, it'd be kind of nicer if it was a communication site, honestly. So, um, yeah, anyway, uh, go check those out. Communication sites are live in everybody's tenants, and you could share them with external folks if you want as well. Awesome. I have a, an Office 365 update as well here, and that's around SharePoint Framework. So SharePoint Framework, they announced this past week that there's a feature that's been requested for a while, and this one was kind of a, a left hook out of, out of left field. Mm. But they have enabled us the ability, developers the ability to deploy a SharePoint Framework project that is tenant scoped. So if I deploy, if I create something like say a client side web part or an extension, I now have the option to include that at the for all site collections within my uh, within my Office 365 tenant. There's an update to the generator, the SharePoint framework generator that you have to use to get this to work. Um, and effectively, what you're doing is you're telling the you're telling SharePoint Online ignore any feature provisioning type stuff that has to happen. Instead, you're just really kind of turning something on. So, mm. and you'll see that when you go to deploy this or when you install it, it says this is tenant scoped. You know, are you cool with that? It's really simple to take advantage of. The concept is really simple as well. They did a really good job with it. Dan, it just kind of hit us out of the blue, which is, I guess, which is a nice update. But I did talk to the team when I was out there. It does sound like there's some more kind of surprises prior to Ignite that may be coming, maybe not, maybe waiting for Ignite. So uh, keep your eyes peeled. Very cool. Yeah, that can be useful. Now you can have your uh, with a web part on all your sites. Exactly. Or the, a stock ticker <laughs> on all of your websites. Just like we all, we've all we needed that since 2003. <laughs> it's like, yeah, every demo known to mankind. Yeah. Excellent. I've got another one here along on Office land before we move on to some Azure news. The People API is available in Microsoft Graph version 1. So this was, I think, in the beta endpoint for quite a while, actually. Mm -hmm. But there's a new People API, which comes along with a couple of new permission scopes that you need as well. But it lets you get access to sort of person as a first-class citizen and groups as a first-class citizen, I guess, if you will. Uh, so, for example, you can query for for people. You could see contacts and bits and pieces. And then groups, you could find out unified groups, implicit groups, public distribution lists, and personal distribution lists all through this API. I believe it was in beta for quite a while. And it also gives you access to some of the things like, I believe, some some of the things like people around you and stuff, the stuff that drives Delve as well. I believe is also available, but it also gives you the, you know, sort of a better standardized way to, to get access to people as a sort of as a first class citizen through the graph API, which is kind of nice. That's awesome. Very nice. Yeah. Nice to see some, um, some more graph improvements. We use it pretty heavily. So we'll be looking at those for sure. Mm. Got some Azure news for us? I do. I do. I've got some Devi Azure news here. So they have announced actually the beginning of August. They announced that there is a new Jenkins plugin to deploy to straight to Azure App Services natively from Jenkins. So what this allows you to do is that you can do now native Jenkins deployment straight to an Azure web app. Depending on your environment, you can either use Team Services together with Jenkins or use this plugin all by itself to deliver your cloud apps. Now, the way that it looks like this is going to happen is that you can either do you can do it one of two ways, or I guess one of the two ways is kind of 2A and 2B. So one way you can do this is using Git or FTP to deploy the web app straight to the Azure web app service, if you want to do it that way. The other way of doing it is that you can have this Jenkins plugin create a Docker image and either push that up to, say, Docker Hub, which is the, I guess, it's the default public image registry for containers yeah. that Docker provides, or you can use a private registry. And specifically, this one is done with the Azure container registry. So you can have your registry living in Azure, which is nice if you have images that you want to keep private, you want to pay for it as part of your Azure subscription. And if you're going to be hosting things in Azure, it's going to be a lot, I don't know how much faster, but it's definitely going to be faster to take advantage of deploying containers using um, the Azure Container Registry if they're going to be if they're going to be executed from within Azure, so you can deploy them either one of those two ways. And if you go the container route, that's going to be deploying these through a web app that's on uh, that's living up on on Linux. So there are some of the things that are that are updated as well. There's a new storage plugin for Azure that that lives in the pipeline that allows you to code and in the pipeline to code to upload and download your build artifacts. And that's also going to be on the link that I will stuff in the show notes for people to take advantage of. Very cool. Very cool. Hey, well, your number one fan tweeted about Azure over the last couple of days. Elon Musk. 
I know he's waiting for your SPFX course, AC. He is. I can just feel it. I got a text about it last week. I got a funny story about Elon. Uh-oh. Yeah, he didn't like changes to our... <laughs> Have I told you this story? You've told me this story. I don't know if you've told me this story in the context of the podcast for others to hear. I, I, I love this story, though. You should tell it. So while I was working at Microsoft, I think I can tell a story. It was long enough. It was long enough ago. Just be careful. They might fire you. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> true. That would be bad. So while I was working at Microsoft, I got a request, actually, from... Um, from the Microsoft account team who forwarded me an email that said um, from Elon to the Microsoft account team disagreeing with the changes to the keyboard shortcuts in Outlook and specifically in OA. And he's obviously quite a power user of email and just drives entirely with keyboard because there were some keyboard shortcuts that changed between, I think they were using, SpaceX were using I don't even know what version of Exchange on-prem they were on. It was old. And they moved to, I think, 2013 at the time. This was a while ago. Something like that. Anyway, some of the keyboard shortcuts changed in OA, and he didn't like it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we had to investigate a way to add those said keyboard shortcuts, I think, back to OA. And it turns out, I think the solution was or ended up being to create a language pack specifically for a fictitious language that we could add to OA because they were on-prem because of like ITAR rules and security and all that sort of stuff, right? I think now they're in 365. But anywho, this was before that. that They could add a language pack to OA as part of their Exchange installation to add the keyboard shortcuts back that Elon liked in OA. And um, I don't know, he probably called it like a Klingon language pack or something (laughs) something like that. The EL-ON pack? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, apparently I think you could put in keyboard shortcuts for a language pack or something. It was possibly an accessibility feature that we used to huh. add those back in. But anywho, that's my Elon story about shortcuts in OA. That's awesome. Yep. Anyway, he uh, he tweeted about Azure over the weekend, or um, yeah, I think it was the weekend. It was the 11th, late last week. Mm. He First he tweeted, he said, Open AI, which is his AI startup that he's got going on, a- OpenAI, first ever to defeat world's best players in competitive esports, vastly more complex than traditional board games like chess and Go. So they've created a bot that plays Dota 2. Mm. Can you, I don't even, I've never played it before. I've but never heard apparently of it. It's yeah. kind of a big deal, apparently. And so their bot won a 1v1 game against some of the best Dota 2 players in the world. And pretty convincingly a number of times, which was pretty cool. Anyway, so he followed up that tweet with another tweet that said, would like to express our appreciation to Microsoft for use of their Azure cloud computing platform. This required massive processing power. So, um, yeah, Microsoft and OpenAI, I think we've said on the show before that they went into a partnership or some sort of agreement some time back to go use Azure for his OpenAI computing project. And they're obviously using this to power that bot, which was pretty cool. That's very cool. Huge for Microsoft getting an endorsement like that from Elon, though. I think, I mean... From Elon about AI. I was going to say about AI and Azure. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say you can't buy publicity but like that, but I'm pretty sure they did. Yeah. <laughs> I think they might have given it to him. <laughs> I think they might have given it to him, yeah. <laughs> or at least, you know, pennies on the dollar or something. I actually don't know what's behind that deal in the commercials, but uh, I suspect, <laughs> yeah, something like that. So, but hey... It's awesome for Azure and it's awesome for OpenAI, so why not, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's cool. That's very cool. Yeah. So Elon's uh, all over Azure. That's awesome. I got Well, I got another bit of Azure news here. This is a nice update for customers, free update that you can take advantage of. It's new and improved Azure Log Analytics. So they're rolling an upgrade out to existing customers today. New customers will get this by default. It's a, what they're doing is they're adding a very powerful search, smart analytics, and even deeper insights. One of the cool things about this upgrade is that the upgrade provides an interactive query language and advanced analytics portal that is powered by the highly scalable data store resembling Azure App Insights. Mm. So now like they're, the log analytics makes sense. App Insights is turning into like the monitor for all of your cloud-based applications. And in fact, I've seen some really interesting uses of App Insights recently. Victor Whelan, who's an Office MVP, does a lot of work with uh, Teams, uh, Microsoft Teams, and extensibility. And he had created a Yeoman generator for Microsoft Teams. And when you go take a look, the project has since been, what I was about to say, I think was going to come across 
a negative way. I don't mean for it to. It's been assimilated or acquired or assumed by Microsoft. It's now part of the Office Dev group on GitHub. So it's no longer quote unquote owned by Wichter. It's now owned by Microsoft. So, but anyway, when I looked, when you look at the source for this, I don't know if, if Wichter did this or if Microsoft did it after Wichter jumped into it. I haven't looked at the commit mm-hmm. history, but every time that the generator is being called in all the different settings, it was calling out to App Insights and logging all those things. So you could see what the usage was like for the application. That's a pretty cool way to take advantage of App Insights. Yeah, for sure. I'm actually using it for when people are watching videos on Voitanos. I'm actually sending hits back to kind of see what videos are most popular. I get that kind of traffic, that information from the place I host the videos, but this way you kind of get more, I get more trend stuff across the entire thing, which is nice. So Yeah, that's cool. And aggregate it all in one spot. Yeah, yeah. It's very cool stuff. Very cool. Yeah. Azure is expanding regions again, and this time two new regions in Australia and specifically for government. So this is really interesting. I think I've said on the show a number of times that I think Microsoft's presence and its continued expansion around the world in different geopolitical areas is one of its secret weapons, and this is another step forward in that regard. So there's two new regions available in the first half of 2018, so they're coming online early next year, and they're specifically for the government in Australia. And what's interesting about this is it's not Microsoft data centers. It's a third-party data center or data centers, the Canberra data centers, CDC, they call them, not the Disease Control, Center for Disease Control. Yeah, so they're running the data centers, but Azure are deploying into them. So they meet all of the standards for the Australian government for classified data and all that sort of stuff. So it makes it kind of straightforward for Microsoft to get into that into that space and not have to jump through all those hoops just for one country. But kind of really interesting strategy. I think it's really, it's a real critical piece versus AWS that Microsoft has over them that they're starting to leverage. And um, yeah, so this geopolitical expansion is kind of, I think, a real key to Microsoft's long-term success with enterprises. AWS seems, they seem to cater much better for startups from the States specifically, but Microsoft seems to be doing a really great job for enterprise customers. And I think that all of this investment is going to pay dividends down the road. Agreed. I think the the global scale of the global capacity that Azure has to offer, plus the ability to have more data sovereignty capabilities than what other public clouds have is certainly a competitive advantage. I mean, over other ones, it's... um, Yeah. And Microsoft's spending billions on this, right? Like billions and billions of dollars on expansion. But they don't do that lightly. mm -mm. And um, it is a forward-looking investment, that's for sure. A good friend of mine, uh, this is interesting. Well, to me, this is interesting. A good friend of mine was recently working for a company that they decided to shut down the business unit that he was working in. So it was one of those, you can find a new job or you can take an early severance or whatever. And he was like, oh, this makes mm-hmm. sense. Let's go see if I can change some stuff up. So he was an AWS guy big time and recently joined another company through leaving the old company. And they are a Microsoft shop and they're mm. playing a lot of the stuff with AI. And he kept coming over to me. Gave, he was rolling his eyes. And I think what you get with a lot of people in the Valley that are like, I'm an AWS person, Oh yeah, I'm not, you know, I gotta switch over to Azure. We kind of discount Azure. You see all the articles, they, they focus on AWS, they focus on Google Cloud Platform, and a lot of them just completely ignore Azure as a whole. But he is, it's been interesting watching his, the learning process he's been going through over the last few weeks, the last two months, and learning more and more about what Azure is all about, what it has to offer, specifically, just recently, the AI stuff. So he had told me, that, you know, hey, the the AI piece, AWS is leading in the AI space. And I kind of looked at him like, that's not who I think is leading in the AI space. I would think it's more on the mm-hmm. Google and Microsoft side. And he totally discounted it and came back. We were sitting by the pool yesterday while our kids were at swim practice. And he's like, I got to talk to you about Microsoft's AI story. And I just kind of grinned ear to ear. I'm like going, yeah, it's, a, it's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> They're definitely getting there, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's pretty interesting. Watching them, watching them uh, sort of come around. You'll have to keep tabs on them. Yeah, I definitely will. I asked him. I was like, "You want to get on the show and talk to us about your learning process?" And he just that's middle and the immediate was immediately was, uh, yeah, I don't think so. I'm not really up for doing the podcast thing. I'm like, you're not doing the podcast thing. I'm just throwing a mic in there. We're having a conversation. Yeah, fair enough. While many IT teams struggle with the impact of deploying Office 365. 
Zscaler customers are experiencing 40% or greater network performance across file download times as well as TCP and DNS connection times compared to using next-gen firewalls and UTMs to route Office 365 traffic locally to the internet. While you may know Zscaler is a leader in cloud security, they also have hundreds of customers who are processing over 1.2 petabytes of Office 365 traffic monthly through the Zscaler cloud. Visit www.zscaler.com to learn more. Hey, so any more news before we move on to some picks? We've got some exciting picks this week. I don't think I have any more news. I just have two picks. Okay. You want to start with the picks? Yeah. You got two. I only have one, so... You might as well go first. Sure, it sounds good to me. So the first one is, uh, shocker, all about Legos. Lego, sorry, Lego. Dun, dun, dun. This is a CAD program to design your Lego that you want to build. And it's a whole like computer-aided design app that he's got. So there's a post, a project up on uh, GitHub that a guy has posted, shows where he's gone through and designed a few things. It's designed, supposed to work for both Mac and Windows. I pulled it down on my Surface, played with it a little bit. It's at leocad.org, and then you can from there you can see the link to it on GitHub where you can find more information about it. He's got screenshots up there about building some simple stuff, building the um, for doing like the Tower Bridge, showing the different pieces that are needed and all that stuff. Wow, it's pretty cool. That's cool. Maybe I could use this to design my crawler for the satin v you could probably get away with that Ooh, that's pretty smooth yeah. i like that yeah i'll have to check it out so that's one and then of course the honorable mention is the one that someone linked to us both on facebook yesterday which is the sr1b is now a lego idea option or submission. Do you see that? Oh, no, I didn't. SR, no, not SR1B. Sorry, SR71. Oh, sorry. I thought you were talking about the satin variant. Yeah. Yeah, SR71. Yeah, I did see that. That looks pretty cool, too. Yeah. It's just like, God, just take all my money. <laughs> like, just too many, there's just too many good ideas. <laughs> like, I'm just a sucker for this. this Here's my Amex. Just just destroy me. Just, yeah, can I get Lego by subscription? <laughs> Lego and space by subscription. Yeah, exactly. So my other link, this applies to me. I don't know if it applies to you. I'm not sure how new your laptop is, but I recently got a new MacBook Pro. It's got the touch bar on it, which I really like it. I do not miss the function keys at all. I wish I could disable Siri on it because I keep hitting Siri. I have no interest for Siri on my laptop. But this is a guy who's taken a tool called the Better Touch Tool, which allows you to create your own custom gestures and all this other stuff huh. on a MacBook. One of the things that, that it also does, it lets you create custom buttons on the touch bar, and he mm. shows how to you, how to do take that to have it call an Apple script, which will call from the command line a curl, which will run curl from the command line, so you could call a uh, do an HTTP post against a webhook, and then... He's shown how to use um, Ift to hook it up to be able to do things like change the lights and stuff like that in his house using the touch bar on his um, laptop. So what I'm mm. actually trying to do is to do the exact same thing, but I've got something called a busy light outside of my office to mm. essentially tell the rest of the family, I'm on the phone, I'm working, or I'm recording, so please be quiet. And I want to be able to hit the button. It's tied to my Skype for business account, but... I don't really use Skype for business. It just kind of flags it when there's a meeting. But So I have to go through and put yeah. something as a meeting to say I'm busy. What I'd like to do is have those lights on my, uh, that control on my MacBook so that I can just be like, I'm busy, I'm recording, whatever, and it can show me what the current color is that's showing for the kids yeah. because I can't see it from where I sit. Sounds like you need an upgrade to that solution. You need a Philips Hue light that you could just plug in and hook up with smart things or something and then you control it from the internet. That's really what I want, to be honest with you. You're right. Yeah. I want a light that I can, because I want to be able to put those lights in a couple spots in the house so that when mm. someone walks That's in, they idea. can see that, hey, you know, this is a, he's recording. So when they pull in the garage, they know not just come walking in the back door and be like, hey, dad. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good idea. Now that school's back yeah, in you session. Yeah, you could do that with Philips Hue lights, you know, the, the Wi-Fi connected bulbs, if you want to stick them in existing sockets, or you could you know switch a couple of switches out. But the, I think the Philips Hue also gives you color control over the bulbs. Yeah. So use that. Yeah. Hey, I've got a pick. It's called Moonwatch Only. It's a new in-print book as well as a digital book about the Omega Speedmaster that all of the astronauts bar one wore to the moon. So um, it's a book these guys have built about, it's the definitive guide to the Moonwatch and how to identify all of the Speedmasters. So the Speedmaster is the is the model. It's from Omega is the brand, obviously. But the Moonwatch, 
they call them moon watchers because speedmasters at the time were what they took to the moon. And um, they're the only watches that have been to the moon other than one. And one astronaut actually took a different type of watch, his own personal watch, and it's the only watch that's been to the moon that's in a private collection. All of the others are still owned by NASA. But anyway, the Moonwatch guide is all about the, the Speedmaster series of watches and how to identify them and all of the embellishments and the complications and the and the different designs and straps and the whole nine yards. I have a Seamaster, uh, which is also from Amiga, but I aspire to owning like a, a 1968 or 67 Speedmaster from Omega. So uh, it is just future. I guarantee it. It's just a matter of time. No pun intended? <laughs> no, I guess not. Yeah. <laughs> These are beautiful. I mean, it, it, the history associated with them too is really cool, but just, it's so cool. It's so cool. Yeah, so you can, you can actually get it in physical print, but there's also a digital version as well you can get. I think it comes out on iBooks or something, so you can go yeah. sort of interactive and all that sort of stuff. But anyway, moonwatchonly.com. This is very cool. Yeah. Very cool, man. Go mull over that and check it out. All right, AC, thanks for another great episode. Absolutely. Thank you very much. See you all next time. Yeah, man. Take care. Did you like this episode? Please tweet about it and drop a five-star review in iTunes. Word of mouth recommendations are the most effective ways for us to grow the show. We'd really appreciate it. If you have a question for us, go to microsoftcloudshow.com slash questions, where you can submit it as text or record it as an MP3 or WAV file and provide a link so we can play your question on the show. Our theme music is brought to you by Keith Ritchie. For more information on Keith's music, head to music.kritchie.com. You can subscribe to us in iTunes and Google Play Store by searching for Microsoft Cloud Show or via RSS at microsoftcloudshow.com, where you'll also find show notes of each episode. You can also find us on Facebook searching for Microsoft Cloud Show or on Twitter at MS Cloud Show. And finally, sign up for our mailing list by heading over to our website and entering your email to interact with us, participate in upcoming interviews and other cool stuff. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.